Uh, okay, so uh, let us start. I'm going to share the screen and uh, let's begin. So, so my presentation today would, is called uh, JDK Thread Pools, uh, Pitfalls and Hidden Gems. And uh, since uh, a lot of us are actually using JDK Thread Pools, uh, even if we are not aware of that, uh, I think this uh, topic will be interesting for uh, the uh, for the Java developers uh, who want to have an in-depth understanding on how of how parallelism is implemented in the standard library, because all the um, uh, all the abstractions that are built on top of standard library are, of course, using it and uh, the configuration options it provides. So uh, before we actually start, I'll, I'd like to introduce myself. Uh, I mean, Arthur uh, already did a good job of that, but uh, nevertheless, uh, my name is Mikhail Gorbunov. Uh, I'm a lead software uh, engineer with a background in Java development. Uh, I have a, a tiny website I uh, had set up recently. It's called www.voidaspect.com. Void Aspect is my alias. Uh, you can go to that website. I'm going to publish some blog posts on Java development, uh, algorithms, uh, and uh, some such. Uh, if I feel like it, because uh, let's be honest, one of the uh, virtues of the great programmer is laziness and that I have an abundance of. Okay, so uh, enough about me. Uh, let's start uh, the actual presentation. So today we are going to revisit the basics. I will look at uh, the Java threading model and why we need thread pools to uh, work with threads efficiently. Uh, then we will look at some real world case where uh, a fork join uh, kind of workload went wrong and caused us uh, some grief by uh, introducing a deadlock uh, on live deployment. We'll, uh, I will uh, explain in detail how that happened using a stripped down proof of concept. Um, we will uh, see some live code and actually uh, like don't do this at home, uh, boys and girls, but uh, I think uh, th this will be a useful case for all of you. Uh, after that, we will take a look at uh, Java's, uh, at, at, the, at, the, at the workhorse of uh, parallelism, which is the thread pool executor. We will look how this single class can uh, give us uh, a very different uh, configuration possibilities for uh, very different workloads. And uh, uh, we will also review its, uh, I would guess, younger hipster cousin uh, called fork join pool, which, which was introduced in uh, Java 7 and expanded further in uh, Java 8 and later versions. Uh, after that, uh, we will uh, do some future.get, literally, uh, and uh, review some of the changes that will be introduced into uh, the JDK when the uh, project Loom comes out and we'll have virtual threads and how will that affect thread pooling. So uh, with that in mind, let's go. So. Uh, let's start with the fundamental question. Uh, why do we need thread pools? So uh, to answer that question, we should revisit the basics of the Java threading model. Uh, as uh, is stated uh, in the JDK specification, uh, the uh, most, uh, I would say, common uh, threading model for Java and the threading model we use in all our application is called one-to-one -one threading. Uh, it means that every JVM thread is actually just a thin wrapper around an OS thread, so a native thread. And that, and, and that makes uh, the threads uh, we create in JVM precious resources. Uh, why? Because uh, 
first of all, an OS thread is uh, very memory expensive. And uh, if we create too many of those, we will get an out of memory exception. Uh, every OS thread has its own native stack, uh, its own uh, execution pipeline. And uh, I would say that uh, the approach uh, they take in the most performance critical applications, such as, uh, for example, high frequency trading. So uh, things where you have to uh, you have to achieve sub uh, millisecond latency. Uh, so in those kind of kinds of applications, they do the thing called uh, threat pinning, where they uh, make sure that uh, every thread they create uh, uh, in the Java application is uh, matched with a specific processor core so that you don't have any context switching between threads. Uh, so uh, what so th that's what makes uh, threads so expensive in Java and uh, uh, that's why we need to have uh, thread pools. So thread pools are the way to deal with precious resources. Like for example, when you have a database connection, which is also an expensive resource, uh, you have this thing called connection pool. So the pooling is a technique we use in software design to deal with the resource, with precious resources, with their life cycle and uh, with uh, allocation of these resources to the consumers. Uh, so what, uh, so the, so a thread pool, uh, so a thread pool, uh, in case of threads, uh, we can reuse the ones we have in thread pool for executing new tasks. Uh, so, uh, in general, when you have a Java thread, uh, you uh, can only execute one runnable on it and then it dies. Uh, a thread pool maintains a thread uh, that is alive uh, in the scope of the thread pool. Uh, its life cycle is controlled by the thread pool and it can execute multiple tasks such as runnable and callables. Uh, so we can reuse the ones we have in a thread pool for executing new tasks. And uh, by adjusting the pool size, we can distribute the tasks efficiently and reduce context switching. Uh, so to summarize, we need thread pools for, central, for centrally managing the life cycle of the threads we use in our application, for allocation of those threads to consumers, and uh, to uh, reduce uh, context switching between threads. That's like a general overview. So uh, with that in mind, uh, let's look at some real world case uh, that uh, I actually encountered in my recent project where we actually needed to use the th a thread pool and uh, how it uh, allowed us to shoot ourselves in the foot. So uh, let's take a look at the problem. So we had to do some dashboarding basically, uh, some dashboarding uh, which involved uh, collecting data from multiple independent sources. And we had a non-functional, but a very strict requirement that uh, this whole data aggregation process should take uh, no less than, let's say, n seconds. So to uh, fit those hard, that hard requirement, we decided to uh, do the uh, data fetches from different sources asynchronously, so uh, that we don't have to wait uh, for one source uh, before we actually uh, request data from another one. So we decided to use the standard, uh, like industry standard abstraction over the thread pool called Spring Async. Uh, it also had some configuration on top of it provided by the client's uh, framework, but it was basically like Spring Boot with an async annotation. So uh, the problem, we needed to fetch, uh, to fetch uh, data from several independent sources. The solution, we decided to use asynchronous requests. And so we decided to use uh, a sync annotation with thread pool executor to uh, 
basically achieve this and uh, have uh, asynchronous fetching of resources. And it worked fine for a while uh, before uh, we uh, actually uh, had to write an asynchronous method that called several other asynchronous methods and aggregated their results. So uh, not just uh, one aggregation, but like a two level of asynchronous aggregation. And then uh, the way uh, our thread pool executor was configured, it was called uh, the subtasks. So, so it caused the subtasks or like the second level uh, asynchronous requests to go into a waiting queue with no free threads to execute them. In short, a deadlock. Well, uh, the lock was not completely dead, to be honest. Uh, we had the sense to set timeouts for all the tasks, uh, but still, it was freezing the whole data aggregation pipeline, like a software equivalent of a multi-car traffic accident on the main road in peak hour. So uh, let's see like a quick uh, proof of concept of what happened. So uh, if you are familiar, the main uh, class that we use, that we are using for thread pooling is actually called thread pool executor. If you worked with executors library and had like something like uh, executors new fixed thread pool or new cached thread pool, it basically all uses uh, the same class called thread pool executor with different configuration. So this was. This is a, an approximation of what happened. So we had a thread pool executor and we submitted like a top level task called, let's call it an outer task. And then that outer task submitted uh, two other uh, inner tasks uh, into the same executor, into the same executor. Mm. Okay, so uh, let's uh, let's try and run this code. So as you can see, it printed out the result of outer of an outer task, but then it just it just keeps going, and it will never ever end. This is a deadlock. Now, uh, who wants to tell me what went wrong here? Uh, so it looks like we have a thread pool with one uh, active thread yeah, and we pushed a task there uh, where we push two other tasks and wait for their execution. But if because thread is single, uh, he's not executing this push at tasks and it's just waiting for their execution, but no, we don't have other threads to execute them. Yeah, looks like a good idea, but uh, as you can see, the maximum pool size here is 10. So, oh, sorry, missed it. So uh, uh, the the uh, top, the, like high level understanding was that, uh, well, yeah, so, so. May I ask, I suppose that uh, thread pool uh give one another thread when we achieve some maximum of, of array blocking queue so this is the reason why we can uh, achieve one more thread is it right yeah it's it, that that's actually correct so uh the way thread pool executor works is uh that uh if you configure it with a queue then uh, it will not create new threads beyond the core pool size while there is all, while, while there is still space in the queue. 
So only if we uh, only if the queue is filled, only then it will allocate a new thread uh, up until you reach the maximum pool size. So uh, by default, it will only allocate the maximum of one thread. So yeah, so, so the uh, first answer was also correct. We only have one thread in this pool and we will not allocate another because we only have uh, two tasks. So it's lower than the capacity of the blocking queue. And uh, so uh, these two tasks will never get a thread because the only thread that's there is waiting for these two tasks. So they block each other like a cross a thread uh, deadlock. And uh, the way to solve it is actually to uh, adjust the configuration of our executor. So this was like an, this is like an approximation of a, a default configuration that uh, uh, the client uh, that the client's framework uh, gave us for the a default thread pool. So my approach, like as as a grizzled tech lead, is to never touch default configuration until it gives you some problems. And then in this case, it gave us a huge problem, and we had to look deeper into this configuration. And this actually prompted me to do some deeper research on how thread pool executors actually work. So um, let's replace it with a synchronous queue. So if you don't know the syn a synchronous queue is a queue with no capacity. It uses this thing called direct synchronous handoff. So uh, when we actually add an element to this queue, it is not actually added, but instead it just wakes up the consumer and the consumer uh, immediately takes this uh, element from the queue. So in this case, the queue will be full instantly. And uh, uh, this will uh, let us allocate new threads from the elastic part of our pool. As you can see, three threads were allocated in the pool, uh, one for outer task and two for each of the inner tasks. So this is uh, how you get a deadlock in production and uh, how you can solve it. Uh, so, uh, Let's have a look at this class because it seems like there is much more to it to it than uh, uh, than we can see initially. So a thread pool executor, uh, a class that does many things and uh, it does them well if configured properly. So it consists of uh, three principal components. Those are the core pool, the elastic pool, and a queue. So let's uh, look at those components. So uh, a core pool is a part of the thread executor's pool that uh, is that has at, at most uh, at most core pool size of threads. So those threads are uh, initialized if uh, no threads are available. So if we uh, go back to our example. Uh, if no if no threads are available, then we allocate a new thread, for example, for an outer task. And uh, uh, we can also uh, pre-allocate those threads by uh, using the pre-start all calls or all core threads method of the thread pool executor. So if you are using the thread pool executor directly and not via an interface such as uh, Executor service, uh, we can actually call this uh, method called pre start all, call, all core threads and it will pre allocate all the threads that uh, it, it will pre allocate the number of threads equal to the core pool size, which is one in this case. Uh, those core threads are kept alive until the pool shuts down. Uh, but that can be configured as well. So uh, there is uh, this thing called uh, core thread timeout or allow core thread timeout. It's a method 
it's a method that allows us to set a flag that will tell us if the core threads uh, will uh, actually be uh, shut down after uh, after some time. After some time. So by default, core threads do not time out. They stay alive until the actual thread pool is shut down. And only then they complete all the tasks and get shut down as well. So uh, another part is uh, another part of the thread pool executor is called the elastic pool. Uh, it consists of the non-core threads. Uh, non-core threads are initialized if no threads are available. So if all the existing threads in the thread pool are busy and the queue is full. And uh, these threads are discarded if they are not used uh, for a set period of time. So for example, in our configuration, the keep alive time is set to 60 seconds. After 60 seconds, the non-core uh, threads, uh, after, after the 60 seconds of not being used, the core threads will be shut down. The core threads will be shut down. And if we set the uh, allow, core thread timeout property, then uh, the same would be true for the core threads as well. Uh, the maximum amount of, of the non-core threads is equal to maximum pool size minus the core pool size. So we set the property code uh, maximum pool size, which is 10 in our case. And uh, uh, so, uh, if you follow this math, uh, we can have maximum of nine non-core threads. A maximum of nine non-core threads. Any questions here? Maybe someone has anything to add? All good so far. Ah, okay. So uh, let's proceed then. Uh, the next part, as I said, is the queue. So the queues uh, came. Uh, the, the queues come in different shapes uh, and uh, with different properties. Uh, by the way, uh, I actually uh, one, once read an article that. Uh, uh, stated that the, the Java is actually the best language to implement uh, blocking and concurrent queues. And, uh, <laughs> that's why we have like uh, a dozen implementations of uh, blocked and of blocking and concurrent queues in the JDK. But for the specific purpose of thread pooling, we have three main implementations. First of them is for unbounded queues. So unbounded queues have unlimited capacity. And this means that, uh, for example, if we're using it in a thread pool executor, then uh, we are probably using it in a, a fixed size pool where we need, uh, where we don't go beyond the core pool size. So uh, this means that uh, every new task that uh, doesn't get its own thread, will just be assigned to the queue. And uh, in this case, we will want to use a linked blocking queue. So a linked blocking queue is uh, a blocking queue implementation using a linked data structure. But uh, the thing with it is that uh, by default, it has uh, basically Oh, practically an unlimited capacity. It's called, it's actually integer max value, but we can say it's unlimited because we will get out of memory before we actually hit the capacity. So it's not like uh, completely unlimited. It's just, uh, it's limited by the JVM memory. Uh, and we can also use it as a bounded queue by setting capacity. So we can set maximum capacity and use it as a bounded queue as well. We can also have uh, an implementation that's specifically designed to support uh, bounded queues. It's called array blocking queue. And uh, well, 
well it's uh, actually a, a better way to do bounded queues than linked blocking queue uh, for example because an array based data structure will always uh, consume less memory than uh, a link a link based data structure uh, and of course, if we want to uh, have a queue without capacity, then we use synchronous queue, which uses direct synchronous handoff and uh, uh, basically has all the consumers uh, taking the elements element from the queue immediately after it gets put there. So it's it's not actually a queue; uh, it's more like. Um, it's more like an edge case, but it's uh, useful when you want to have uh, an elastic thread pool uh, and you want to have as much units of concurrency as possible. Uh, and we will discuss a bit later where you actually need it. Okay, so. Uh, here, as you can see, we are using synchronous queue. Mm. So, a uh, quick reminder. So, avoid dependent tasks if you use a queue because it can cause a deadlock. And another quick reminder always set timeouts on your futures because if you get some sort of deadlock, at least it won't be completely dead and uh, uh, you will actually just have a timeout. Mm. Another uh, another little thing you can configure with a thread pool executor is called a rejected execution policy. So what uh, is the rejection execution policy? It is basically a, a, it, it is it is basically a callback that that tells uh, the thread pool executor what to do if it can't accept new tasks. And uh, a thread pool executor can uh, be an, in the state of not being able to accept new tasks in two cases. First case is when you shut it down. So when you shut down a, a thread pool executor, then, uh, then it can't accept new tasks. And the rejection execution policy is in effect. Another a case when you can't accept new tasks is when you don't have a capacity to do so. So you don't have a capacity when all the threads in the pool are busy and the queue is full. So if we reach the maximum amount of threads and we reach the maximum capacity of the queue, then we can't accept new tasks. So this is like a way of dealing with back pressure. Uh, if you understand where, where I'm getting. So uh, if the consumer is overly eager and just bombards the thread pool executor with tasks, then uh, we can set up the rejection, the rejected execution policy to uh, tell a thread pool executor what to do if it cannot accept new tasks. So we have three, we have four, uh, basic uh, like standard uh, uh, execution policies, and we can also define our own execution, uh, reject ex execution policies. So the four standard ones are board, discard, discard oldest, and color runs. So default, the, the default is uh, to abort execution. It throws a rejected execution exception. You can actually, You can actually uh, see the interface called rejected execution handler in the Java UQ concurrent. And it allows us to, to implement our own, uh, our own execute, uh, rejected execution handlers. So to add a rejected execution handle he handler here, we need to add it to a constructor, let's say, discard policy. So um, let's 
let's see what we have. So let's see what we have. So the first one is abort policy. Can you see the screen? Uh, like the actual code here? Yes. Of course. So um, as you can see, it just throws a rejected execution exception. So the second one is called discard policy and it just does nothing. So if we run out of capacity or shut down the thread pool, then uh, adding new tasks will just uh, do nothing. So these tasks will never execute. Uh, so a third one is actually a bit more interesting. It's called discard oldest. And what it does is it uh, pulls uh, the head of the waiting queue. So it uh, removes the task that was waiting uh, the most. So the oldest task in the queue and it discards it. And instead we put a new task on the queue. And instead we put, we put a new task on the queue. Uh, so the fourth one is actually my favorite. It's called cover runs policy. And what it does, it just, uh, well, if the, if the thread pool is shut down, then it behaves ex exactly like discard policy. So if the thread is, uh, if, if the thread pool is shut down, then it just discards the task. But if, uh, it's alive and it's just the case that we ran out of capacity, then it makes the caller thread actually execute the runnable. So it just uh, like, it's, it's like telling uh, the, the caller thread, the producer, I am too busy, run it yourself. And why it's my favorite, it's because it's a natural way of implementing throttling. So uh, if some producer is overly, um, is, is, is like overly demanding of the thread pool executor and just submits a ton of tasks uh, to it. Then uh, it will just, it, it, it will make this producer run some of its own tasks. And that way it will stop it from adding new tasks to the thread pool executor for some time. And, uh, and uh, that will allow the thread pool executor to deal with the tasks it has right now. So that's why it's my favorite. Uh, nice. Mm. Okay, so let's uh, let's uh, think about what kind of configuration we need for what kind of workload. So in optimization, we generally differentiate between CPU bound tasks and IO bound tasks. I don't think I need to explain uh, why those are different. Uh, so for a CPU bound task, we want to uh, basically have uh, to basically, uh, uh, there, there is no point for a CPU bound tasks uh, to go uh, with an amount of threads that's higher than your hardware can support. Why? Because you won't get uh, your tasks executed faster. In fact, if you have more threads than uh, in the thread pool than the amount of uh, cores your processor has, then uh, you will actually get a slowdown because uh, you will have to pay the price of context switching because uh, you will have to switch between uh, threads on every core. So for for those kinds of tasks, especially if they are independent, like for example, we have some sort of a uh, parallel parsing and uh, we just, uh, load, we have loaded something into memory and we want to parse, parse a bunch of text. And uh, for these kinds of tasks where you like, for example, uh, have different pages in the text and uh, you want to distribute pages between threads, you want to have uh, the number of threads in your thread pool that's uh, equal to the amount of threads your actual processor can support. So to get that number, you can actually use 
a standard method from the JDK code, runtime available processors. So this gives us the maximum amount of uh, the maximum amount of physical uh, threads that uh, the processor supports. However, the situation is different with IO bound tasks. Why? Because uh, if, if uh, let's say you want to submit a bunch of asynchronous requests and you do so on a fixed size pool, then mm, for every request that goes after you uh, submitted the, uh, the, the, the that goes after uh, the uh, core pool size. So if, if if all the core threads are busy and you submit new requests, then it has to wait before it actually gets sent. And why that's a, is that a problem? It's a problem because for IO bound tasks, uh, the most time is spent actually waiting for the response from some uh, remote server or whatever. So if uh, we have an IO bound task, then uh, the price we pay for context switching is actually negligible compared to the price we pay for not sending this uh, request earlier. So we want to send the request as early as physically possible. And uh, for that reason, you might, you might want to want as many units of concurrency as possible for, uh, the, uh, for, your, for the IO bound workload. That's why uh, in uh, the server side programming uh, right now, uh, the trend is to use asynchronous IO which uh, which uh, can like reduce blocking on on the framework level. You, you mean non-blocking IO? Yeah, like non-blocking IO such as Node.js mm -hmm. or Netty or whatever. Uh, and that's why uh, that's why uh, there is so much talk about uh, core routines or virtual threads, uh, which are like cheap units of concurrency. Uh, that can be used for dispatching asynchronous uh, requests, asynchronous EO requests, even though they don't actually give us a speed up in a CPU bound workload, they actually allow us to get more throughput, get more requests uh, sent for, for an EO bound workload. So it's, it works for both clients and servers that way. So for IO bound tests, you want to have an elastic pool. So if we are talking about like standard JDK, then uh, we have uh, this class called executors, which already provides us uh, some of the same as the defaults for configuring thread pools. So for CPU bound, you will probably uh, do something like fixed thread pool. And for EO bound, you will get cached thread pool. So what a cached thread pool is, it's a basically a, a thread pool executor with a core pool size of zero. So it's, it's the same class, but it has a core pool size of zero and it has the maximum pool size, which is unlimited integer max value. And as you can see, it also uses a synchronous queue. So uh, every time you add a new task and all the threads are busy, it just adds a new thread. And those threads exp expire after 60 seconds. So uh, another good thing about this cache thread pool is actually that it can scale down to zero. So if you don't use it, then it doesn't consume any resources and all the threads just die. While the, uh, uh, while the fixed size executors, such as single thread executor or fixed thread pool, those uh, actually consume resources throughout their life cycle and only release them when they are shut down. So any questions here? All clear. Okay, great. Uh, so uh, now we come to the hard part. 
to the dependent tasks. As I said, a fixed size thread pool is okay for uh, is okay for uh, like uh, not for like independent CPU bound tasks, and the uh, cache thread pool is okay for. Uh, for most IO bound workloads. And it's also kind of okay for dependent tasks if you don't have like a whole bunch of levels of dependency. Uh, so cache thread pool can quickly become very huge because as you've seen, it doesn't have a really a top limit on how much many threads it can create. It can create threads it can create a lot of threads to support your desired level of concurrency. That's why it's uh, not necessarily uh, a good thing when you have a task that is split that splits itself recursively into multiple subtasks, and every one of those is also splitting themselves into uh, a bunch of uh, tasks. So this is what's called a fork join workload. Uh, when you uh, fork a task and then you join the results. Uh, so uh, let's uh, say, for example, that we want to create a parallelized web scrapper that analyzes a website such as Wikipedia. So it uh, should do uh, a search of this graph of links. And uh, for every link, we want to have an asynchronous request. And then uh, after we analyze that page and collect all of its links, then we should create an asynchronous uh, request for uh, for every single one of those. So this is where a cache thread pool will run into problems very soon. We can still uh, probably do this uh, using the thread pool executor. We just will need to co to configure it correctly not rely on the default uh, configuration, but actually see what's best for us. But uh, we can also look into using a fork join pool. So a fork join pool, as I said, it's kind of like a younger hipster cousin of the thread pool executor. And it's specifically designed to work with uh, the tasks that recursively split, like for example, recursive task from the Java UQ concurrent. Also known, you, you can also have a, a recursive action if you don't need the result. So a recursive action is just a recursive task that returns void. So for those kinds of tasks, you would need a fork join pool that supports that supports these kinds of workloads. Mm. So let's actually look at what happens if we uh, let's uh, just a quick reminder. So if we run this code with our current configuration of a thread pool executor, then we get three threads allocated. So let's instead use a fork join pool. By the way, it, JDK already gives us a, a, a common pool for, uh, so, so that we don't have a lot of thread pools in our application. It already gives us a common pool, which supports a, a parallelism level equal to the number of processors. So that's available for processors for you. Uh, so as you can see, as you can see, uh, it actually executed the outer tasks on the, the outer task on the main thread, which actually makes sense because we already we, we get it immediately after we submit it. So we don't need to dispatch it to a separate thread because we will be just uh, wasting like uh, time on, on on dispatching. We can just do it in a, in, in in the main thread, and it also. Uh, executes these two tasks uh, on the uh, single thread, which is common pool worker three. We can also allocate our own fork joint pool. And I think it will actually uh, be more 
So let's say it's it has a parallelism of one. So if if we set something like this in the thread pool executor, then it actually will cause a deadlock. But with a frog join pool, it will work just fine. In fact, as you can see, it just allocated one thread and executed all the three tasks in it. If we have a parallelism level of say two, and as you can see, it allocated two threads. So we don't directly control the number of threads it allocates, but we can kind of set the desired parallelism level. And the thing with thread pool with the fork join pool is that it will efficiently distribute the uh, subtasks between the threads. So to do that, uh, it implements this algorithm called work stealing. Uh, is anyone familiar with this concept? Okay, so work stealing. Uh, for every thread uh, that uh, is maintained by the fork join pool, uh, it, basically every thread has its own separate queue of subtasks. So instead of having like a global queue, well, it has a, a sort of a global queue, but uh, every thread also has its own queue. And when a thread is not busy, when it's uh, not doing anything, uh, it actually can uh, spend its time, spend its processing resources to look at the queues of the other threads. And if it sees uh, tasks uh, on the queues of another thread, uh, on, a, on a queue of another thread, it steals it and executes it itself. So threads basically steal tasks from each other, and this way, uh, this way, uh, the queues uh, get balanced between the threads. So do you understand this concept? Yeah. So this is one of the things that fork joint pool does to uh, kind of uh, balance uh, the uh, to, to work with uh, dependent workloads with recursively splitting tasks. Uh, one of the places where the fork joint pool is used actually is in the uh, in the parallel streams. So with Java 8 you can have parallel streams and those actually use by default they use the common uh, pool to execute the parallel tasks. However, you can actually <laughs> execute uh, the uh, parallel thread task on uh, uh, on like different on, on like a different fork join pool. So to do that, you can submit. Let's say submit. in stream range parallel and then uh, let's say for each And let's see how many threads we are actually using. Let's set the parallelism level to 20 because it's larger than the default thread pool, which is using just the uh, amount of threads that the processor supports. Ah, of course, I forgot to get this. So basically, what am I? What I am doing here is that uh, is I am submitting the uh, parallel stream task within uh, like to, to, to like a future. So it's a callable that's submitted into the fork joint pool. 
and it should be executed on the thread pool. So as you can see, you have like worker 3, 11, 17, 5. You kind of have a bunch of workers here. Uh, if you do this on on a default pool, let's say like with a, with a regular parallel stream. As you can see, uh, it also actually uses the main thread. But uh, uh, as you can see, we have only like maximum of 15 here. But uh, the number of different workers will actually be equal to the number of uh, threads in uh, that are supported by the processor. So in my case, it's probably eight. You can check it. Uh, yeah, it's it's eight. So we should see like eight of them. So 15, nine, uh, three, seven. 11 oh, like, uh, and nine is I'm, I'm seeing so it's yeah it's it, it's about eight different threads that we have for a default configuration and if we execute it within another thread pool uh, within another for joint pool then we have a lot more workers uh, and why is that it's because uh, uh, when we actually uh, want to get the a common pool, then it, it will get uh, the pool that's uh, assigned to this thread. So if we execute it within our custom for joint pool, then uh, the threads within it will know that they belong to this uh, executor. And that way we will achieve the desired level of parallelism for our, for our parallel streams. That's how you adjust parallelism of the parallel streams. So, uh, is that uh, is that clear? Thank you. Very useful example. Okay, so um, we don't have a lot of time left uh, before we actually start our Q and A session, but. Uh, I wanted to like give you a quick overview of what we are going to have with Project Loom. So a Project Loom is uh, the project to get uh, virtual threads to Java. So virtual threads are not one-to-one uh, -one mapped to an OS thread. Instead, they use this thing called M2M mapping. So with virtual threads, you will have a pool, sort of a pool of carrier threads. So carrier thread will actually be mapped to an OS thread. And on this carrier thread, you can actually create a bunch of virtual software threads, like uh, sort of like coroutines. And uh, in contrast to the threads we had before, these virtual threads are actually very cheap to create and discard. So because they are not mapped to an OS thread, not native, uh, they are scheduled by an internal scheduler instead of an OS scheduler. And uh, th that's why they are very cheap. And you can have like hundreds of thousands or millions of them without sweating. And uh, that's why that's why with uh, virtual threads you don't necessarily need thread pooling. So you can just create and discard them on demand. Uh, so will we see 
the reduction of use of threat pools with the coming of virtual threats. I would say uh, that, uh, yeah, uh, some of the cases where we use threat pools, we can just swap them with, uh, swap them uh, out uh, to use uh, to use virtual threads instead. However, however, uh, we can still benefit from a, from centralized uh, life cycle management, from centralized allocation, uh, even if those if those threads are cheap, and we can also benefit from the extensive and very convenient API that the threat pool executor framework gives us. That's why uh, currently in the project Loom there is this thing called a virtual thread uh, virtual thread pool. Uh, it's it looks like this. I mean, I don't use the for, the project tool build, but you get my idea. Virtual thread pool, and this virtual thread pool will give us an executor service that allocates virtual threads. And uh, in contrast with the thread pool executors we had before, such as thread pool executor, for and pool, it doesn't reuse threads. Instead, it allocates a new thread for every task we submit. And uh, that's uh, like, uh, like an edge case, but it also allows us to bridge this gap between uh, using uh, our uh, like uh, regular threads and virtual threads because it uh, allows us to use the same API with callables, futures, uh, uh, invoke all, invoke any, whatever. And this, uh, and that's why the actual executor framework will not be deprecated, and instead it will only be expanded with an, with an addition of new methods and so on and uh, so forth. So. Uh, this section uh, was supposed to be a bit more like uh, speculatory, but uh, if you have like any ideas or suggestions here, you are free to put them forward. Uh, so uh, this concludes uh, my actual presentation, and I think that uh, it's uh, it's time for us to have an actual Q and A session. So, uh, so folks, you're free to ask me questions. I'm going to disable the screen sharing for now and. Uh, uh, let's uh, have a discussion. I, I have a question about virtual threads. Of course. Uh, as I know, in older version in Java, we had some kind of green threads that sounds pretty much pretty similar. In yeah, it is kind of similar. Yeah, uh, I I want to ask you about reason why we reject this opportunity to use green threads and now we again back to this uh, stuff. Well, when the green threads uh, were introduced as an idea, it was actually very early in the uh, in the history of, J of, Java, of the Java platform. And uh, the idea of the multi uh, of multi threading being like a commonplace thing wasn't was not there yet. So uh, most uh, processors were single core. You had support for like multi-processor workloads, but uh, 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 for the sake of simplicity, they decided to just use one-to-one -one mapping. And, uh, uh, and uh, as you might imagine, the, imp uh, the, the idea of the green threads back then was kind of green, so it wasn't very polished, and they decided to just discard it. That's why uh, 
right now they are returning to maybe some of the things that were introduced back then, but uh, in a new uh, in a new way, I guess. So uh, virtual threads is a much more mature thing, and it will uh, and it also should be backwards compatible with current JDK thread implementation. Yeah, I got it. Thank you. Um, hello, one question for me. Uh, as for the parallel stream execution, um, as I saw from the example, uh, the if we don't specify specific thread pool, then main thread also will be used for the execution. I Is actually, it... I actually did specify the specific thread pool. I specified the fork join pool common pool. And the common pool is something that's actually used a lot throughout JDK. If you, for example, uh, look through a source code of the parallel sort algorithm, uh, you have arrays.parallel sort method. And it actually uses uh, it actually uses the uh, for join pool dot cam common pool to execute the sorting algorithm. All right, uh, so my question was about uh, how safe is it uh, to when the uh, like processing might be executed on main thread if we will have some few places in uh, our application with, for example, some logs. Um, yeah, so I think it might be dangerous for all application. Well, you can, yeah. uh, well uh, any kind of uh, problem with logs is always dangerous. Uh, I mean, the idea for the fork join pool was that it suppo was supposed to execute very short living uh, recursively splitting tasks. Uh, so uh, explicit locking is discouraged there. But uh, yeah, so uh, uh, the thing with the uh, thread with the fork join pool is that when the threads are not doing anything, they're trying to execute tasks from another threads. I'm not sure how uh, does that tie in the locking for invoc, but uh, I think that it. Uh, can actually lead to some problems if you do explicit locking in the recursive tasks. Okay, see, thank you. That's why I don't recommend the fork join pool for uh, blocking IO. Okay, thanks. Also, Mihailo, I have a question, a great presentation, by the way. Um, do you happen to know um, what is criteria to reuse the threads during, for example, for example, uh, in the uh, example that you have just discussed with Yeni, uh, the main thread is reused. And for the other example, you uh, had two tasks, nested tasks, and they were picked up by the same thread and not by, you know, not by different two threads. And, you know, what's the heuristics behind it? So, as I said, uh, uh, Basically, uh, if uh, uh, if uh, uh, a fork join tasks task is waiting for uh, some bit subtask to complete, then it can actually just proceed to the subtask without uh, waiting. So uh, it detects this uh, thing where you uh, submit a task and then. Uh, you wait for it to execute. And uh, instead of just uh, waiting, this thread uh, actually executes one of its subtasks from its queue. OK. Do you happen to know that uses some code analysis or maybe compiler markers to do this kind of optimization? Uh, it doesn't use code analysis. It's just that. Uh, uh, when you, it, it, it's just the uh, implementation, uh, how the future interface is uh, implemented in the for example. So uh, when you call a get method inside of a for join thread, instead of just blocking a thread, 
it actually uh, sees whether it can uh, execute this task directly. Uh, I see. All right, cool. Thank you. I also can see a question from uh, Alexei. Uh, doesn't it make deadlocks while stealing threads? I believe uh, I have demonstrated that uh, uh, that uh, we didn't have a deadlock there. Uh, or can you please expand on your question, Alexei? Alexi was asking this question when you were talking about. Ah, okay. Uh, so I believe I already answered it. Yeah. Or, or didn't I? Like, uh, yes. Thanks, Alexi. Uh, any other questions, folks? Yeah, one more question. You were talking about um, we need to pay price when uh, we're switching the context between threads. Uh, is it applicable for the physical thread switching or virtual also? Well, for the virtual threads, uh, it's negligible because, uh, as I said, the uh, scheduler is uh, implemented inside like Java process. For the for, because for switching context for for, for actual uh, for actual OS threads. For the native threads, you have to do a Cisco. Uh, so you have to do a Cisco to the kernel. Kernel has to uh, has to switch the context for the processor. This is uh, relatively expensive. All right. This can introduce latency on the CPU bound workload very very easily. Mm -hmm. uh, and in this case, can we um, ensure that? everything runs on one physical thread. So we do not switch the context. Well, uh, this is actually, well, it, it, it's actually a bit tricky to do so, but uh, yeah, you can uh, do a thing called thread pinning. And I, I was uh, talking about it earlier. Like uh, the thing they do for high frequency trading applications uh, where they uh, do, uh, a series of optimizations that ensure that the threads are pinned to uh, the actual core. So you can research this, but it's uh, not a, something I, I can answer like very easily. Um, but yeah, just by keeping the number of threads uh, close to uh, the number of uh, close to the number of actual cores, you can reduce uh, context switching dramatically. So for uh, like uh, most applications that don't require sub millisecond latency, uh, just keeping the number of threads close to the number of processors would uh, ensure that you will not uh, have problems with context switching. I mean, you will get maybe some context switching, but that would be negligible. Okay, I see, thank you. Yeah, also one more question about, um, you, you were talking about um, threads that are looking into other threads and stealing uh, yeah, some the, of the, the resources. The, the, the workers in this, for example. Yeah, yeah right. So uh, why uh, this type of architecture was designed? Why we hadn't um, like some type of uh, class a bow that looks into its sub threads and dispatches uh, resources between them. Like, um, what is the profit of one thread looking into other threads, seeing that they're available and still in the resources instead of having? Uh, uh, maybe, maybe I'm not clear here, but uh, they are looking for uh, other threads that are busy. 
So they are, they are looking, they, they see that the thread is busy and it has tasks in its queue. So to offload it, a free thread can steal tasks from the thread queue. That's that way threads, uh, we, we don't get uh, a situation where one thread is uh, always busy and other threads are just slacking. So basically each thread has their own queue, yeah? Yes, that's correct. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. I have one more question about core and elastic pool size. Yeah. Uh, uh, can we consider situation when uh, some of our threads die, for example, due to some unhandled uh, runtime exception, uh, what will going on with the thread? We create new thread or we just give some thread from- The threads the in, the, in the thread pool won't die from a runtime exception. This runtime exception, will you will get it uh, from the future, but this will not stop a thread. So they are caught inside. Uh, threat, yeah. I got it. They are wrapped with the execution exception. Mm -hmm. And uh, the thread will forever when it gets runtime exception. Is it still alive? Yeah, it is still alive and can accept new tasks. So the ex exceptions here are scoped to the actual task, to the actual future you get from the from the callable. Uh, so if some task fails, it doesn't mean that the thread gets killed or whatever. It's just one of the possible uh, conclusions of this particular task. It can succeed or it can fail, uh, but that doesn't affect the overall uh, health of the thread pool. I mean, there can be situations where you, for example, you set the threads in the thread pool to be demons and uh, you shut down the JVM and uh, the threads get killed before they actually execute some critical piece of code, but that's the problem with the demon threads as usual. I'm not sure whether I understood it correctly, but is the fork joint pool um the same as single thread uh, no, it's executed. Not. All right, uh, in case we're not specifying the parallelism. In case we're not specifying the parallelism, then the default uh, parallelism will be used. Default parallelism is, uh, uh, I believe it's uh, the number of processors. If we set the parallelism of one, then, uh, it uh, will uh, it will only have like uh, it, it, it will uh, work sort of similar to a single thread a single thread executor but with the difference that it can actually handle dependent tasks so for a single thread executor you can easily deadlock it with a dependent task because you only have one thread and uh, an, un an unbounded queue. And for the fork join pool, if you have dependent tasks, it actually uh, will put it on uh, on the threads queue and instead of waiting uh, for uh, the dependent task, it will pull it from the queue and execute it on this thread. So in that, uh, it's its behavior behavior will be different from a single from a single thread executor. Am I clear here? Yeah, yeah. thanks. Okay, uh, I think there are no any questions more. Uh, so. I think that was maybe great, interesting, and useful. Uh, Mikhail, uh, oh, thank, let's, let's hope so. <laughs> yeah, thank for the speech. Uh, I enjoy it, and I think other watchers, uh, listeners feel the same. Uh, hope 
it was uh, not your last performance for our community and soon uh, you will tell us something else uh, and something interesting i'm looking forward to for, to collaboration with you in the future yeah uh, once more thank you so much for your time and performance uh, and maybe sir he want to say something no just wanted to say thank you that was really good and deep you know um dive into the uh, topic I, i know that community was actually demanding something on the thread of concurrency stuff So thank you for closing the gap. I could suggest maybe we can follow up with the demon threads if that's kind of uh, you know something that community is interested to learn about. Demon threads? I mean, so that's I don't think that warrants uh, like a separate presentation. Like it's a very simple concept. <laughs> All right. Okay, I, I think we can we can uh, we can create something. Uh, maybe it can be small meeting. Um, uh we can do this uh, in the future um okay uh, thank you once more and, uh, and now i want to tell something to for our participants uh your feedback is important uh, very important for us after this meeting uh, i will send uh, for all uh, our feedback form and i hope you will fill in it um and we are looking for speakers um, uh, if you have a big passion about uh, public speaking and want to perform you're welcome uh, you can present your topic or we can suggest uh, you something interesting and uh, we you're welcome we are waiting um and uh, i think that's all uh, we will inform you about our next events and we will waiting for you So have a good day and see you soon.